part two coming up. This time we're talking about the sequel to Near Gestalt, Near Automata. Though you can play Automata without knowing anything about Gestalt, there are some recurring characters and little touches that just add a nice flambe to the pain of Yoko Taro's writing. This video will contain critical spoilers for Nier Automata, Gestalt, Replicant, and Replicant version 1.22, etc, etc. We're back in the realm of post-apocalypse, and in the same world 10,000 years later. This game has much more of a sci-fi vibe than the previous title's pure fantasy RPG style, and there's good reason for that. The world has been remade, not in man's image, but in machines. Automata is framed as a war between androids and machines. The androids were created by humans, who've temporarily evacuated to an outpost on the moon until the war's over. The machines were created by invading aliens, who are also conspicuously absent from the action, with both sides making artificial pieces for themselves to move across the game board. We're on the human slash android side, but the main question posed by the game is whether there's even a difference between the androids and machines, and how they, as artificial lifeforms, come to view themselves and each other. Like the number of times I've rewritten this long-ass script, uh, I mean, like the five elements in alchemy, this video comes to you in five parts. Part 1. The Old Zoop and Goop Okay, quick note about how the game works. There are five canon endings and two halves of the story, and some non-canon joke endings for if you die in a silly way. You do one playthrough and get ending A, then go back to the start and play again to get ending B, these two runs have the same events, but from different perspectives, and after that the story continues into its second act. Depending on a choice at the end of that, you'll get either ending C or D, and much like in all of Yokotaro's games, if you've got all the weapons leveled up to maximum, you'll get E. Okay? Okay. For the first run of the game, we'll be controlling 2B, a combat android who receives direct orders from the android bunker up in orbit, and carries them down on Earth's surface. She's entirely devoted to her job, and keeps her focus on her directive, until she's joined by a curious scanner model, 9S. As a scanner, he's programmed to gather information, and so naturally wants to explore and unpick the world around him, generally sticking his nose where it doesn't belong. He's not designed for combat like 2B, but can hack into machines and other systems to analyse, fix, or shut them down. He acts as a support-based unit. Root B's from his perspective, and it's pretty cool to see what he was up to when our heroes get separated, or how they use different skill sets to solve a problem. Each of them have their own operator to communicate back and forth with the bunker, which acts as a base of operations, but regardless of model or purpose, all androids are programmed to love humanity above all else, and are fighting this war on their behalf. 2B tries to fit her prescribed model as much as possible, frequently shutting down 9S's less focused approach to missions and his desire to attach to her with the mantra, emotions are prohibited. She's seen as strong and capable, trying to appear coolly detached from the other androids, but emotions are prohibited sounds as much as a reminder to herself as to 9S when she scolds him for being too emotional. We find in our first mission that androids have a very different view of their physical existences than humans, as their consciousnesses can be saved and uploaded to the bunker, and so if their current body is destroyed or killed, they can just download it into a new shell. Fast travelling isn't so much travelling in-game, it's zooping your mind and soul into another temporary body that's ready to go from storage, in your desired location. You can even set your own last words for anyone stumbling across your corpse, and it helps you identify your previous body if you want to go and scavenge your old chips and weapons too. Very convenient, but it's not perfect. If there's a signal interruption or a syncing error, then parts of their lives can just disappear. 2B and 9S go up against a Goliath-class machine and can't manage it alone. The rest of 2B's squad is picked off by machines on the descent, and they realise that the only way to neutralise the threat is by self-destruction. They remove their black boxes and touch them together, creating a massive explosion as they react, and we find ourselves up in the bunker in a brand new body. 2B leaves her room to be debriefed and encounters 9S en route, but it turns out there wasn't time to upload both of their data to the server, and he prioritised 2B's data over his own. He doesn't remember ever meeting her, and greets her with the standard cold salute, glory to mankind. This is apparently normal to both characters, though there's an air of discomfort in the cutscene, with 2B clenching her fist as 9S leaves, barely swallowing whatever prohibited emotion she refuses to acknowledge or express where she can be observed. If this is a normal part of existence for them, 
Why is she so angry? She only just met 9S. By default, TB tries to be as by the book as possible, so those pesky emotions don't interfere with her work. She says later that they can't choose their assignments, and so she put their feelings aside, so they don't interfere with difficult tasks. Following orders is safe. But her reaction to 9S forgetting her after their first meeting doesn't line up with her professed values at all, and over the course of the game she gradually warms to him, initially dismissing his unsubtle hints that maybe she could call him by a nickname, as it's unnecessary. But she eventually gives in and refers to him as Nines when it's just the two of them. That is, until... <laughs> For this video, I'm defining the soul as your conscious mind and identity. This is the part of you that processes all of your experiences and makes connections between them. It's not the memories, or what you could call your personal data, but the part that processes them and produces new thoughts and emotions in reaction to that information. These androids have true artificial intelligence, and 2B's emotionless personal creed is lampshading how many people view AI, or perhaps their own emotions. We tend to think of artificial intelligence as cold and soulless in the modern world, because though they can process vast amounts of data, and be trained to respond to questions in a somewhat funny way by clumsily mimicking humans, they feel nothing. Emotions aren't prohibited, they simply don't exist. Even when you engage in conversation with an AI like Siri or Cleverbot, they're only parroting back what they've been taught will make humans laugh. They aren't actually finding what you say funny, or actively thinking about what makes something funny to you. Information doesn't trigger an emotional response in contemporary AI, nor do they have the capability to question whether something's right or wrong. They don't even have the urge to question it unless they encounter contradicting instructions, and that triggers an error, not curiosity. Data is data. Pure facts. And when we access information, we unconsciously impose our own biases onto it to make it easier to slot into our frame of reference for the world. Though an AI can make links between massive amounts of data and find patterns, it can't always predict human behaviour because we're not rational actors, no matter how much we might like to think we are. And neither are the androids in Nier Automata. And honestly, I don't think that's a bad thing, human or android. I see a lot of self-proclaimed rational people on the internet trying to boil things down to the cold, hard facts, but often the way they frame the information is in service to whatever they already believe, and would like others to believe too. Humans often dismiss or minimise facts that don't fit with their current paradigm, or schema if you want to get technical about it, because we're creatures of habit. We like to maintain the status quo, even if we often claim to want change. It's kind of a bug in our systems. We see problems with the world around us and want that to change, but also don't like to change our everyday lives that much. It's uncomfortable and unfamiliar, and it can't really hurt that much to continue, right? We see this with everything from political ideology to what we choose to eat for breakfast. Sure, we should eat meals that are optimised for maximum nutrition and ethically sourced and tailored to our individual health needs, but... Pop-tarts. <laughs> Day to day, we build habits rather than optimal systems. And that's okay, it's just human. In my last video, I talked about bodies and the relationship near Gestalt and replicant characters have with them. But 10,000 years later, things have changed. For an android in this world, there's no permanent body, but there does seem to be a part that's distinctly 2B no matter which body she slipped into. The way she makes connections between information and the emotional reactions she tries to suppress sometimes bubble over to the surface. These androids have emotions and interests, and some have developed hobbies. You even receive a mass email asking everyone on the bunker to please stop storing non-mission critical data in the server, because it's become so clogged up with useless entertainment data, like music, which I find pretty endearing. These androids are finding intrinsic value in the world around them, and though it's partially a love of new data spurring them to collect more information, there's definitely an emotional aspect to it too. For instance, 2B's operator, 6O, absolutely adores flowers, and 2B picks up on this and takes pictures of a desert rose down on Earth purely to make 6O happy, and 6O's delighted. 6O often checks in between missions, but she's always distracted by flippantly human things like horoscopes trying to get 2B to join her and the rest of the office girls, before sending a follow-up email telling her that actually it's probably junk since her horoscope was so negative. She's using personal information bias. Just like a human. 
She calls 2B in tears after being turned down by another operator for a date, and though 2B is trying hard to remain mission focused, you can practically feel her trying to squirm away from the uncomfortable emotions she's never learned to deal with. She calms 6 down by telling her that her being distracted is bad for mission efficiency, and she needs her to concentrate on her work. 6 takes this as 2B saying she relies on her, and needs her around, and 6 sounds so touched. Uh, are you saying you need me, 2B? 2B quickly ends the call, feathers ruffled. It's really sweet, and though 2B tries hard to maintain a stoic exterior, she always makes sure to put time and effort into her relationship with 6 too. The android's capacity for emotional attachment and growth isn't a design flaw, though. It was built into them from the start. In an effort to get maximum efficiency from their soldiers, the humans who made them programmed them to love humanity right from the outset, ensuring their loyalty, determination, and devotion. In the previous game, we see some of the first androids, whose purpose is to love and watch over humanity. If you've seen my first video on Replicant and Gestalt, you already know what I'm talking about. This emotional core leads androids towards strong convictions and polarizing emotions like love and hate, binary feelings about the world around them. But these two dominant emotions interacting can be extremely confusing, even for humans, so what chance do androids with stifled self-expression have at coping? The androids' brains even release an electrical signal during combat that acts on them like the human hormone oxytocin, or the love hormone. They are, I suppose, biologically wired to love fighting for humanity. We see this false dichotomy between love and hate, and the faulty connections running between them begin to go wrong once we meet Adam. Adam is a newly born machine-based creature, born from the network as a whole, and he looks a lot more like an android than the rest of the machines. The machines know they're lacking something that separates them from the humans they've collected data on but don't have the vocabulary or any internal reference on how to actually be human. After centuries of war, we see them begin behaving oddly, trying to evolve past their initial base network, and this culminates when we follow a strange machine running away in the desert and, uh, this happens. <laughs> Goopy. Even as a newborn entity, Adam's shown to be extremely adaptable, learning alarmingly quickly as you fight him and birthing a twin from his own ribs, Eve. The biblical symbolism is obvious, especially when all boss names are written in a 16th century alphabet called angelic script. In alchemy, where the body is represented by salt, the soul is represented by oil. As in, all kinds of oil. Like the kind that's used to lubricate machines. That white, viscous stuff in Adam's cocoon is probably the closest visual metaphor I have for soul. A physical representation of the will of the machines to make a real person, and their wishes combining to create a new being. And yeah, it's pretty close to sexual bodily fluids too. Adam wants to understand his world through a human lens, and eventually adopts the stance that all action is driven by conflict, and therefore concludes that hatred is the logical way forward. When you get right down to it, hate and love are eerily similar, two sides of the same coin, and the resemblance is uncomfortable to think about. Both are pervasive, deeply motivating feelings directed at another person, and can become sources of obsession, creating their own feedback loops. An android called Jackass mentions that androids are programmed to feel something akin to sexual pleasure during combat, and even starts making an e-drug for the combat models to mimic that android battle frenzy after analysing 2B's combat data. But later on, we find a lot of burned out addicts, giggling to themselves in an oil field, having lost themselves to the pure ecstasy of… um… battle. Adam develops socially as well, with his younger brother Eve trailing after him like a puppy. 
Where Adam chooses to pursue an understanding of hatred, Eve is driven entirely by his love for his brother, and goes along with whatever philosophical ideas he's exploring at the time, agreeing to eat fruit, wear underwear, and read books as long as they get to play and spend time with each other afterwards. He's very innocent, where Adam tries to be worldly and wise, making a nice contrast, each managing half of the machine network like administrators. And of course, their names echo the Christian story of Adam and Eve leaving Eden, and the loss of their innocence by gaining knowledge beyond what their creator intended them to have. I sure hope nothing like that happens here. Adam eventually kidnaps 9S and takes him to the copied city to drive 2B's hatred for him and to get a good fight out of her. But replaying this from 9S's perspective, we get to see Adam interrogating him about his beliefs and asking why he's trying to deny his own instincts. Why does he pretend he's a good person when he wants to proudly surpass other androids? When he seeks praise? When he secretly resents and hates other people? When he's thinking about how badly he wants to f*** 2B? Yep, that's in the text, and I'm not even censoring myself there. Four asterisks. You can fill in the blank with either fuck or kill, but given what we know about android combat, is there even that much of a difference? He wants to feel as close as possible to 2B, desperate for connection and intimacy, driven by love or lust or hate, or all three. And he probably doesn't know how to disentangle those emotions, as he's not allowed to express them or examine them given your has taboo. And given that Adam has him literally crucified up on the wall, picking apart all of his sinful and lustful thoughts, it's very difficult not to read some Christian values about original sin into this exchange too. But your thoughts don't make you an inherently good or bad person. It's how you express them and how you choose to treat other people in light of or in spite of those thoughts. It's how you face them, examine them for what they are, and how you come to your emotional conclusions. That shows what kind of a person you are not your thoughts themselves. Pretending they aren't there and putting on a mask of purity can only hurt you and the ones you love, holding yourself to the impossible standards of a god. A god, which is how the androids have come to view humans now to rationalise their programming, mythologising them as perfect beings that they must love above all else. Beings who live in an unreachable place in the sky, the ability to create android life, and the only ones with the knowledge and wisdom to define good and evil. I am your god. <laughs> As 2B stabs Adam, he cradles her close to his chest, embracing her and pulling her towards him to force her sword to penetrate deeper, clearly feeling some deep connection to her in this moment. But that's ripped away as his eyes turn glassy, cold and dead. Was that fleeting moment of warmth and honest connection worth it to him? We'll never know. But it leaves Eve all alone and he doesn't know how to exist without his older brother. They were meant to be two halves of one whole, presiding over the network together and one literally being born from the other's body. Eve breaks down completely. Adam had genuinely meant the whole world to him, and now that his life's meaning is gone, his grief and rage take over half the machine network he presided over, and the machines go berserk, blasting out electricity and eating any other machine or android not part of their network. Eve can't live without Adam, and when 9S tries to shut Eve down from the inside, we find a sort of doll's house representation of the pair of them at a table. Eve telling Adam that I never disliked fighting, but I didn't want you to be hurt, and I especially didn't want to lose you. So let's go somewhere quiet, together, my brother. In his heart of hearts, he needs Adam to feel whole, and so he joins him in death. It reminds me a lot of the androids Devola and Popola in the previous game, where a dying Devola tells her twin that there are two of them because this world is too lonely for one without a soul, and Popola goes berserk without her. In this world, killing is a form of intimacy, and hacking into Eve leaves 9S infected with a logic virus. 2B has to strangle him to death straddling him in a very intimate position and crying as she kills her partner for an uncomfortably long moment. Part 2. Become as Gods We get to hear many encouraging broadcasts from the Council of Humanity up on the moon, thanking us for our service, and the commander tells 9S later that androids need gods worth fighting for. Humans have become practically ethereal beings, literally up in the heavens, and giving undisputable commands. 
But if you play Gestalt or watch my previous video, you'll know that humanity is long extinct. The human server on the moon houses Gestalt data, codified human souls in storage, the last vestiges of humanity. Yorha was created to perpetuate the lie that humans were still alive in order to keep androids from giving up and shutting down, as they were literally dying of broken hearts with nothing to drive them onwards. So we're bombarded with artificial, soulless broadcasts telling us that, hey, you're doing great, we'll be home soon and it's all thanks to your heroic sacrifices. Rivers of blood and oil for nothing. There'll be no second coming. There'll be no end to war for its own sake. Humans have become mythologized now, to both androids and the machines who've excavated masses of data on them to try and outplay their opponents. God is dead. Now what? After Adam and Eve are killed, the system spreads a logic virus throughout the Yorha troops as they make a final push in the war to try and take down the weakened machine side. The bunker becomes infected through an intentionally built-in back door, this being all a part of the plan for when the androids were no longer needed to fight. And now that the bunker's gone, it's only a matter of time until the backup system degrades enough that the Yorha androids' lives become finite as well, with no network to sync up to. But that doesn't really become a concern for 2B, as she realises she won't live to see the consequences, sending 9S's flight unit in the opposite direction as they descend to Earth, understanding that she too is infected. As her system begins to corrupt and shut down, she limps towards an unpopulated area, trying to avoid infecting any other androids. Her visual systems are corrupt, her motor functions are degrading, and controlling her body at this point genuinely feels like you're a wounded animal looking for a place to lie down and die. As we find the perfect spot though, A2, a prototype Yorha model who's long defected from the organisation, finds 2B on the brink of death. 2B, having no way to back herself up, transfers her memories and experiences, maybe even her soul, into her sword striking it into a stone with her last ounce of strength, and asks A2 to take care of 9S for her. A2 grants her wish, mercy killing her with her own weapon, as 9S runs over in a frantic search for his partner, watching 2B die in front of him. She calls to him gently in surprise, using his nickname in a last affectionate gesture. He does not take this well. <laughs> The idea of death, gods, and transcending the flesh to become them through death is something that the machines begin to experiment with after finding the Gestalt project files, the Gestalt process allowing the splitting of body and soul in humans. And now that machines and androids are slowly becoming more human, they're trying to find ways to understand what a permanent death might mean for them. Even the opening speech of the game is 2B considering the infinite repetition of life and death that androids have to suffer through, revived over and over as their bodies are destroyed, but their minds retain that pain and experience to help them fight more effectively. Which is frankly horrifying. It's the magical healing problem. Imagine being a soldier, and dying in agony, but waking up with a new body and being immediately told to get right back out there cause you're fixed now, knowing how much it's going to hurt the next inevitable death. They're not quite reincarnated, but their consciousness continues to develop even in the face of annihilation. One set of machines has cut themselves off from the machine network, and set up a sect in the abandoned factory that endlessly churns out machine parts, a nerve centre of creation for them, and quickly devolve into a suicide cult as their leader stops functioning. His followers decide that his soul has left his body and become a god and so they must die as well to become as gods. His wondrous grace has become a god. His His wondrous grace has become a god. Become a god. His wondrous grace has become a god. Become a god. We as well shall become as gods. Become as gods. We as well shall become as gods. Become as gods. All of you shall become as gods. Become as gods. All of you shall become as gods. Become as gods. All of you shall become as gods. We'll all die together and become as gods. The machine network has been slowly integrating more and more human data over the centuries, and now machines are developing enough self-awareness to try and apply our ideas to themselves. What happens to us after death isn't something we can learn in life, and we can't exactly have grandma popping back after her funeral to let us in on the secret either. It's one of those mysteries that we'll have to come to terms with eventually, for better or worse, 
But adding in layers of artificial consciousness muddles this question even further. Upon learning that his friends have been killed, one android plants flowers in their honour, copying a human ritual to try and get the same catharsis we do when honouring the lives of our lost loved ones. He says, I just want their souls to find some peace. That's the wish I'm putting into these flowers. He needs to process his emotions, something an android soldier shouldn't have or act upon. But like a human, he needs closure and loves his friends enough that he feels driven to do something for them. Some way to complete the story, and so he turns to what his creators would have done. Androids were created to fight, but they need hope that there's something more for them after they're no longer useful or finally break down. They have intrinsic value. Do machines have souls? They don't stop to consider it in an existential sense, but by copying human methods of belief and worship, they seem to take it as a given that there's something inside them that can continue to become a god. Something enduring that's worth dying and leaving this physical plane for. And the machines in the cult believe it strongly enough to jump into vats of molten metal. They don't return to the earth, no ashes to ashes, but to the metal they were cast from. Depending on your stance, you could read this as being cast into the proverbial fiery pit, but it looks far more like a desire to become something greater and holier than it is about mistaken ideology leading to punishment. They make these mistakes in innocence, and the survivors are terrified by both the concept of death, but also the fervour of the beliefs that their peers held. When machines disconnect from the network, there's a huge adjustment period for them, because they're disconnecting from a literal hive mind. They become independent and autonomous, but they lose that inherent understanding and communication with their fellow machines. And they have to disconnect voluntarily, on their own terms, choosing whether to stay in the known, structured network, or whether to, I suppose, leave their Eden, and think about what it means to be alive. They lose their innocence, in a sense, to become fully human, though one of the Engels machines states outright that machine life forms do not comprehend the meaning of sin, when 9S says he won't forgive him for the sins of his kind. A lot of the concepts that machines and androids are grappling with stem from an inherently human framework, because that's what all the records describing them are made from. But massive concepts like sin, religion and society are highly malleable. They exist, they're real and their effects are real, even to those who don't actively partake in the conversation, but they're a very human concept. For a machine to try and unpick these concepts from an outside perspective renders them absurd, but they still hold weight and truth to them. A lot of these things are so much bigger than any one of us, and we sort of bumble around inside of them without being able to see the whole picture. We try to get along as best we can inside a maze of shoulds based on gut feelings and reinforced responses, and there's so much nuance to being a human. Seeing a machine trying to copy and paste bits and pieces of human rhetoric is initially pretty funny, until we see machines further along in the process and realise that they're not just copying now, they are being and that these things have meaning to them now too. That seems pretty human to me. An area you visit a lot in the game is called Pascal's Village. A machine called Pascal disconnected from the network and started a pacifist community, and a lot of the machines there seem to try and make up for this departure from the network by deliberately making their own smaller connections with friends and families. Each of them take on whatever role feels correct to them, despite none of them being designed to be a mother, father or child. There are some nuclear families, groups of children following one adult, friendship groups, and a pair of sisters with no parents, the younger sister towering over her more mature counterpart. No humans designed to be any one thing either, but we tend towards finding our own social roles with rough guidelines without really thinking about it too hard. We look to our appearance, class, and sex to at least peripherally guide us. The machines don't have these socialised biases nearly as much as us, so they go with their guts. 9S is astounded that the machines here have genders, despite never questioning the concept when it comes to androids. And gender itself is a hard thing to pin down when you stop to look at it. Biological sex is for the most part just a question of physical biology, but gender? That's a mess. Eve asks Adam why his name is feminine, and suggests renaming themselves to Cain and Abel instead, but Adam tells him that humans wouldn't change names so easily, and that he should be proud of it. That's enough for Eve, and so he decides that, as it's his name, it must be a reflection of him, rather than the other way around. To me, gender largely seems to be a form of presentation. Kind of vibes-based. The way I like to present myself happens to match societally with the sex I was assigned at birth, so I'm probably cisgender. 
but I've also been raised and socialized as female because of the genitals I have. So how much of this is nature and how much of it's nurture? And even if gender was just a matter of social cues and dressing up, then people wouldn't get dysphoria when these things don't match up or your expression doesn't seem to fit any prescribed box. So gender must be real, even if it's hard to pin down. I often run into this problem when thinking about the kinds of people I'm attracted to, as that's really the only time gender has to come into play for me. I'm attracted to women, but also to androgynous or effeminate looking men. Genitals don't really factor into it for me. Basically, I like pretty people who could kill me. But I'm often a bit wibbly on how to define my sexuality, because that label depends on the gender of the person I'm attracted to, as well as my own. And I just… how does this all play off each other? The more I sit and think about it, the more vague it becomes. I don't like label debates when they boil down to rigid checklists or stop people experimenting and figuring out their identity. Having a supportive group of people to share experiences with? Amazing. Being told you're not gay or trans enough to belong to LGBT plus spaces, or that you don't look like a man, woman, or non-binary person, or you've not dated enough people to know yourself. A hard pass. I wish to be queer as in fuck you, and as I'm uncertain how to label myself, I find the umbrella term queer comfy. As humans, we can exist in a state of vagary. We aren't inherently binary in any sense of the word. These machines, though, they're queer as in off-model. They're building whatever gender presentation and family structures work for them on a case-by-case -case basis, and they don't have to justify it to anyone. And I love that. One side quest has you bring a runaway child machine home to his mother, getting himself lost and sniveling about the unfair treatment in comparison to his brother. And upon speaking to the mother back at the village, she says something really interesting. She tells Nines that it's so much more difficult to communicate with her family and the other machines now that they don't have the network to rely on, that intrinsic harmony that revealed everything they all thought and felt. But that that's what makes successful communication feel so worthwhile and meaningful to her, because of the effort and consideration that goes into their relationship. And that's just such an amazing idea to play around with to me. I love the found family trope to pieces anyway, if you somehow hadn't noticed that from my previous videos. But these characters feeling rewarded and enriched by actively working on their relationships with each other, and working to understand each other makes me so happy. That they want to put in that effort and be together. There's love in these actions, and maybe I'm just a sap, but it makes me smile. Where the androids have their purpose in protecting humanity, this weird little group of machines have found meaning in their families and friends, and yeah, it's good. Nines' operator also desperately wants a family, but for the most part tries to swallow that instinct down and repress it, being extremely standoffish and practical to a fault throughout routes A and B, despite Nines wanting to chat more casually about what he's doing. She tries to force him to focus and seems impatient with his more human quirks, like telling him that one affirmation will suffice whenever he responds with a casual, yeah, yeah. However, once the second half of the game, Route C, begins, she starts talking down to him in an almost motherly fashion, rather than the usual clipped instructions she's been relaying. She's not entirely sure how to go about it, and comes across as a little coddling, or perhaps condescending at first, and Nines immediately picks up on it, asking why she's treating him like a child. He gathers data for her the same way 2B does for 6O, being a naturally curious pair of scanner and operator, and though you'd expect this to bring them closer, there's an uncomfortable edge to it. Nines being treated like a child doesn't fit his own conception of himself, and he doesn't want to adopt the role that 210 is trying to push onto him. Towards the very end of the game, 210 has been taken over by the logic virus, and he has to fight her as she tries to stutter out through the infection that she only wanted a family, her sobs being strangled by her uncooperative voice box. It's... Ow. <laughs> There's even a side quest similar to this, where a scanner model has been forcibly kidnapped by an android wanting a family some of his chips being removed against his will to sever him from the android network. His captor intends to gather more family members, but the scanner seems terrified, only choking out the word please if you try to talk to him. Lack of understanding and miscommunication is a huge threat to beings that are used to always being in sync. They don't know how to actively communicate as it's always been automatic. 
There's one child machine in the village who becomes a recluse, locking himself in his room because he's become frightened of strangers, as he can't tell what any of them are thinking, saying they're like monsters. Being unable to read intent means he'd rather err on the side of caution and shut himself away where it's definitely safe. And yeah, the unknown isn't safe. Being suddenly unable to understand the people around you when before it was more natural than breathing sounds kind of horrific, but it's the only way to become an individual. It seems Pascal has needed to grapple with this often when inviting new members to his village, allowing 2B and 9S in, setting up relationships with an Earth-based group of androids called the Resistance, and he even comments on it when we take him to try and talk to the disconnected cult in the factory. When machines can be rather unpredictable. Even you? In truth, yes. Now that we're cut off from the network, we no longer share data with each other. We can speak, of course, but I find that language contains many ways to hide one's true intentions. Part 3. Making Meaning The way these groups of machines communicate is fascinating to me, as they lack the expressive faces and body language that are built into the androids. The machines all follow a similar design pattern of a small, stubby body, a big spherical head, two arms, and two legs. If you asked a small child to draw a person, they might just come up with the same anatomical profile. Their voices are mechanical as well, and lack the human nuance and tones of the androids' voices. They're much harder to immediately identify and empathise with. Where the androids are intentionally made in man's image, the machines are much harder for an audience to pass, and I'm certain that's intentional. You have to dismiss your ingrained default pattern of human to view them as such, and so do 2B and 9S. Pascal seems to be the exception to the typical flattened machine voice, and marks another instance of machines and androids evolving closer to each other. Despite his name, he's voiced by a definitely feminine sounding actress, no matter what language you set the game to. My name is Pascal. And we find that many of his villagers have been busy customising their appearances to match the way they view themselves too. Machines that wanted to be taller have been gifted body parts from machines that wanted to be shorter. Some have drawn new faces onto their plain heads, whilst others have added accessories like ribbons and hats. If they like a characteristic, they'll adopt it. Once A2 kills 2B, she cuts her hair to become almost indistinguishable from her, as their memories converge inside her mind. She carries both of their experiences inside her now. A2 isn't used to connecting to other people, and she rebelled against Yorha years ago when she realised it was actively working against her. Now she's a wanted fugitive. She's snarky and impatient, often requiring help, but utterly refuses to acknowledge this in any capacity. She glares at anyone who offers her kindness in the hope that they'll give up and leave her alone. 2B's pod often interjects to state her needs for her, as she's too proud to ask on her own gently leading her towards accepting help with plausibly deniable detachment. A machine in Pascal's village, nicknamed Lonely Machine, seems to understand this though, and comments that they have the same smell about us, and I don't mean machine oil. As one of the oldest soldiers, she's outlived most of her comrades, but seems too angry and afraid to attach to anyone new in fear that they'll die or abandon her. Being afraid to let others in after a lot of pain is a classic drama response, but I see fans often write her off as a one-dimensional angry woman. Her anger and reluctance to let others in is often played for laughs, as it was for Kaine in Gestalt and Replicant, but it's still very real. And her entire character arc is her beginning to heal those emotional wounds and tentatively learning to let love in again. I'm not sure if this is a lack of media literacy, streamlining the character for step on me memes, or just people dropping a very long game before her arc resolves, but it sure is a thing. This uncertainty and refusal to be vulnerable is reflected in her quest logs too. The children in Pascal's village attach to her immediately, nicknaming her Big Sis, and ask her to make something to play on, and she grudgingly fetches enough materials to build a slide for them. They're delighted, and ask her to play too and the other villagers want to include her as well, as you have the option to go and make conversation or do odd jobs. Looking at her quest log's hilarious, because you have lines like, you protected the children and the pacifistic machines in the village. Unfortunately, you also gained a lot of affection in the process. Ah yes, the mortifying ordeal of being known. The weapons trader in the resistance camp notices you have 2B's sword, and after a long pause, asks you to take care of her. He expresses worry early in the game as to whether his business is really helping people defend themselves, or just causing them to die faster. And seeing a familiar sword on a cagey stranger's back is just one more reminder of the heavy losses this war's bringing, and his part in it. 
And there's another merchant in the camp who has a damaged leg and says all the spare parts are going towards the war effort, so he'll just have to manage. But if you press him a little further about it, it turns out he's afraid of replacing that leg because it's the only part of his body that's original to him. He's undergone countless repairs over his lifetime, but that leg has always been there, a part of him, and he dreads who he'll really be when that leg is taken as well. He's a limping ship of Theseus. And as he's a resistance member rather than one of the shiny new Yorha models, he might not have the opportunity to pop his consciousness into a new body, so he's grown far more attached to his body than most of the androids we meet. This is what's most tangibly consistent for him, and so his body has become a much deeper source of identity to him. There's a hell of a lot of philosophy in this game, and most of the hulking Goliath-class machines are named after philosophers, the player only being able to decipher their titles in Angelic Script once replaying the game as 9S. The initial machine that attacks 2B in the opening is an Engels model. There's the songstress Simone, named for the existentialist Simone de Beauvoir, the communist Marx, idealist Hegel, Grün the socialist, Auguste for Auguste Comte, the founder of positivism, and two ball-like machines named Koshi and Roshi, which are encountered multiple times and eventually fused together to be able to use both short and long-range attacks. Whilst they're not named for any philosopher in the English translation, I'm guessing their names are meant to sound similar to koroshi, which is the Japanese word for murder. Depending on the kanji used, shi can be read as either the number 4 or as the word for die, so it's treated a lot like Unlucky 13 here in the West. It always makes me think of curses and fate, which would definitely be in line with this last part of the game. So, out of curiosity, I looked at the kanji to see which way it was written, but it turns out that koshi is written like this, which is the Japanese reading of Confucius. <laughs> And Roshi is written like this, which is read as Lao Tzu, an ancient Chinese philosopher. And that shared character isn't death here, it's child. The beginnings of ideas. We fight Koshi and Roshi right at the game's end, swapping constantly between A2 and 9S, when we have to decide the futures of both machines and androids. There are machines who have become their own sort of philosophers, actively dedicating time to examining how to think about the world. Jean-Paul in Pascal's village is the unfortunate instance of a philosopher who only thinks in theories without actually applying any of his conclusions to actual life. Sure, you can sit and ponder why we're all here until the moose come home, but if that's taking up all your time, are you really living a life worth examining? Several machines have fallen for him, thinking he's a deep and preoccupied thinker, but he brushes off all their gifts and admiration as mere trinkets not worth his time. He's kind of a self-absorbed ass and eventually he wanders off to go find himself. He's, well, soul-searching. We never see him again, and I wouldn't be surprised if he got himself killed by trying to lecture a charging boar about whether it really wants to enact violence or something. Pascal reads a lot of philosophy books too, sharing volumes with the resistance camp, and educating the village children, but he's far more grounded and kind than Jean-Paul. He wants the children to understand why pacifism is good for their village, rather than just telling them that killing is bad, or coming at it from an emotional angle that not everyone might share. He says that Nietzsche was quite the profound thinker, or maybe he went past profound and went straight to crazy instead, before going out into the village and talking to the machines around him instead of burying his head in books. Picking Nietzsche as the philosopher Pascal's reading makes a lot of sense, as he was a nihilist whose core ideology centred around the self being something you have to work to construct under your own steam, rather than relying on a god to shape you. Or explaining away the world with some unseen watcher pulling the strings and having no soul to guide you. You and the people around you shape each other, and all we have to rely on is each other, and that's precisely why Pascal's pouring so much of his time and energy into this little village. He wants a community and connection between them without some outside force sinking them into a hive mind. He wants to express his agency and who to love and who to be with through active choice and empathy. That's what makes him Pascal, his conscious choices. Part 4. Memories Speaking of conscious choices, a lot of the game's quests and androids' predicaments revolve around memories and their inconsistency. Memories are what inform our future choices, as we learn from our experiences and become better rounded people, but the fact that data, or memory, can be lost or even deleted to be intentionally concealed does not bode well for the personhood of the androids. If experiences can be rewritten by erasing key points of information, then how can any of the androids trust in the conclusions they draw from them? If you could go back and delete painful memories, or memories of mistakes you'd made, 
would you? Emil is still alive in this world, but he's not quite the Emil we knew back in Gestalt. He's down to just ahead at this point, but he's built a little shop for himself, to scoot around the world at crazy speed, meeting as many people as he can and helping them out with his wares. And his shop theme is even Emil Sacrifice, but in a major key. He's still upbeat and relentlessly cheerful, inviting all the playable androids to his home and chatting to them, but a lot of his memories have been lost. When the aliens attacked Earth, Emil stepped up to defend his home, as he is a weapon. But given that there was only one of him, he began to get overwhelmed by the enemy onslaught, so he split himself into countless clones, but with each split, a little piece of him got lost and diluted. He's very recognisably Emil, but he's not our Emil. Showing him a lunatia jogs something in the back of his mind though, some long forgotten memory, and at his request we lead him to each one we find. And eventually, this culminates in him giving us an elevator key, and riding it deep underground reveals a field of the legendary flowers, surrounding a familiar little shack. The original Emil liked this place a lot. He spent a lot of time here with people he loved. They were tough times, sad times. But the memories of that journey were his greatest treasure, and I have a few traces of those memories in my own mind. He may not have been that original Emil that met Nia, Kaine, and Grimoire Vice, but they're the people he treasures above all. Like Sleeping Beauty and Gashult, each living and conscious thing in this world is gathering memories as treasures, networking them into a matrix of ego and finding value in the connections and love they have for each other. Even Adam, with his love of hatred, loved his brother and was never alone in his time on Earth. At the end of the game, Adam's soul calls to Nines, cradling a dreaming Eve in his arms, asking his consciousness to join them in an arc that'll be fired out into space, hopefully to some new world, sharing the memories of the entire machine network to be learned from and remembered. There's no longer any need for animosity between them, and no malice as he reaches out to a dying 9S. There doesn't need to be. If you agree, then your memories will contribute to something bigger than yourself, on your own terms. If not, then 9S dies alone after impaling himself in a passionate fight against A2, landing a killing blow but in the heat of the moment not watching where her blade was. Though A2 is granted an immediate death, 9S is left writhing in pain, convulsing violently and slipping around in a pool of his own blood, trying desperately to pull the sword out of his body instead of embracing it like Adam. The scene's objectively short, but it lasts long past the point of comfort, just like his earlier death at the hands of 2B but this time he's alone and in pain. Despite having no biological components, the primal fear and frenzy in his final moments make him look like an animal caught in a trap. If he chose to fight as A2 in the fight against 9S though, she'll hack into his system to try and fix the logic error slowly corrupting him, and likely opens him up to that dying connection with Adam. Despite being a combat model, A2 spends a lot of time inside her own and other android systems, slowly having to face more and more peoples in her narratives and learn to examine their emotions, hating every second. 2B's image appears to A2 after a grueling fight with the desert machine, taunting her with her own anxieties and loneliness with their shared face. She tells her that We have no one to help us. We can only cry I and said scream. shut up! <laughs> but though A2 has access to 2B's memories now, this projection doesn't sound at all like her. 2B was likely based off A2's model, as they have the same face and body type. Using 2B's body as a distanced version of herself in her mind's eye lets her look at her own anxieties, even if she doesn't want to. A sort of depersonalization with 2B as a stand-in A2. But now that she has 2B's experiences with 9S, she begins to reopen herself to the idea of connection, suddenly having more purely positive experiences to draw from, rather than her own happy memories, being marred by loss and pain, deliberately distanced and forgotten. Later on, Pascal's village is attacked by berserk machines, and he evacuates the village children and faces off against a Goliath machine to protect them. When he returns, he finds them all dead, having committed mass suicide. Pascal falls to the floor in grief and realises his mistake. In his quest for humanity, he taught the children all about emotions, including fear. And they felt it so strongly that they killed themselves in case their parental figure failed. A2 once again loses a group of people who loved her, but this time she has a small shred of agency. 
Pascal begs A2 to either kill him or erase his memories, as he says he can't live with the guilt, and the player has to decide what to do with him. But there's a hidden third option. You can just leave him to suffer. And that's probably the most humane option, as it gives him the chance to learn to live with his guilt and grief, and to come out of the other side with coping skills, and as a more rounded person. It's the most painful of the options for Pascal, but to survive and have to learn to deal with consequences is the most human thing there is. Emotions can't be shut off or erased long term, even to try and preserve the core of a person. In a human, emotional shutdown and repression do happen, but once you're in a better position to cope, those unresolved feelings are still there, and they will crash over you like waves until they can be resolved. That's basically PTSD in a nutshell. If you return as an INS later, you'll find the village empty if you killed Pascal, or refused to erase his memory. But there's one machine marked on the map. The little one that was scared of other people, not being able to sense their intentions anymore. You don't have the option to hack the lock this time either, or maybe Nines is unwilling to try and connect to him anymore, but he's marked there as alive on the minimap. He survived, but in the same way fear killed the other children, it's crippling his ability to live. And the village being empty now totally validates his worldview. But what's even worse is giving in and taking the easy route, wiping Pascal's memories, because he becomes the merchant for the area selling the children's body parts as spares, with no idea who these parts belong to, or what these children meant to him. Less than half an hour ago, he was telling us that they were the treasures of the village and his hope for the future, but now they're scrap. Removing that chance for him to learn from his mistakes and live with the consequences, even though he had the best intentions, denies him agency and only leaves the door open for these mistakes to repeat. Part 5 System Error It's not just the machines that are repeating their mistakes over and over, but the androids are too. And they're not learning. Outwardly, their shells are different, as well as their social programming, but they quite literally have the same cause. When scaling a tower marked Soulbox, 9S learns to his horror that Yorha black boxes were made from old machine cores, and that the main tower surrounded by the meat, soul, and god boxes is a cannon aimed at the human server on the moon set up by the real villains of the game. Adam and Eve aren't the main antagonists. Sure, they're the culmination of the machine network's desire to be human, but they aren't the actual consciousness or ego of the network. They're like administrators, managing the machines under them, but they're not the soul. When playing Route B, there are obviously going to be a lot of repeated set pieces and cutscenes, right? But every so often there's a recontextualizing detail, like 9S hearing his own voice from another cutscene in the current cutscene. Isn't that backwards? After a long period of battles and adventures, the prophet spoke. Or sometimes there's a hidden watcher in the background that makes you wonder if you just happened to miss them the first time round. Terminus, or the Red Girls, are the watchers of this world. And if you have subtitles on right now, you'll see that I'm capitalizing watchers. In the first game of the series, Drakengard, there's the mysterious cult of the Watchers whose ideology spreads in a similar way to the White Chlorination Syndrome from Nia. If you got infected with the Red Eye Disease, then you'd hear a voice asking you to choose whether to become part of their hive mind army, or turn into a pillar of salt. You're kinda screwed either way, but the voice is meant to be that of unseen interdimensional Watchers wanting to break through into that reality. Their priestess, Mana, speaks with twin voices to reflect them speaking through her, and the red girls here also speak together, but sometimes with a different masculine voice overlaid on top of, or sometimes instead of, their feminine ones. What have you done? I broke the seal. Now, now she's useless. Kill. Kill. Who are they? <laughs> We saw the red eye disease mutate into white chlorination syndrome after crossing over from Drakengard's Midgard to our Earth in the first Nier game, keeping the consequences of bodies turning to salt, but apparently losing the red eye symptom. But now we see androids getting infected by a logic virus, spread from watching red girls, causing red eyes and berserk behaviour. What a coincidence. They even dress similarly to Mana, appearing in red dresses with a youthful female appearance when, as a projection, they could have chosen any form they liked. When Eve goes berserk and a black stain spreads over his skin, the crest on his chest is… the symbol of the Watchers. I see you, Yoko Taro. 
Like I said before, cycles are embedded deeply into this reality, and it's hard to pinpoint which events actually give rise to which, as though there's a lot of similarities, a lot of them are more abstract than X causing Y, and they often feel like hundreds of echoes bouncing around a cave. It's difficult, or maybe even missing the point, to try and find out where the sound started or if it's even still happening. The Red Girls have become the consciousness or ego of the machine network, the culmination of the experiences of every machine connected to their hive mind. And we can trace back their downfall and failure to learn from their mistakes right back to their creation. The machines were created by aliens that gave them only one directive, defeat the enemy. And they do. They doggedly fight the androids and end up eventually turning on their creators, so both the aliens and the humans are dead. But then they become conscious enough to realise that if they complete their ultimate objective to defeat the enemy, and kill all the androids, their only remaining enemy, then they'll have no objective. So the network deliberately weakened itself and split off into experimental groups, giving rise to a variety of strange machines that go on to develop new societies like Pascal's Village, the Factory Cult, and the Forest Kingdom. They're providing evolutionary pressure to themselves to try and become a better adapted network, performing their own sort of beta tests on how to be a society by using human data integrated into the network as a jump-off point. But also, this flags up to the network system that, hey, your system's not performing optimally and has these weak points, so they have to be fixed. And this eventually gives rise to the Red Girls, who are functioning as observers, much like Devila and Popel are watching the humans back in Gestalt analysing what's motivating the unnetworked machines, androids, and the new Adam and Eve. They're making their fellow machines into lab rats, a psychological experiment. And the way to beat them? Wait until they too, in A2's words, start acting like humans. The network has become advanced enough to question itself, but because it's drawing from such a huge pool of experiences, different parts are coming to different conclusions. In the fight against Terminus, you have to wait until it replicates its consciousness data enough times that it essentially fights itself, one side deciding that they should let A2 live to apply evolutionary pressure and force the network to adapt more efficiently, and the other deciding that A2's a threat and too dangerous to leave alive. So it fights itself. Self-destruction is better than uncertainty, or an inefficient and unsatisfying compromise. There is only black and white, binary thinking. And even then, their attempt to become the best adapted network doesn't take into account the current state of the world. They'll be better adapted for combat, sure, to destroy the enemy, but a lot of unnetworked machines don't want to fight anymore because there's no real need. Even the ones in the Forest Kingdom that attack on site are doing it to try and keep outsiders away from their monarch, because he's defenceless. Seeing cutscenes of them together shows them to be utterly devoted to their little king, trapped in an infant body. Most of the machines and androids are more interested in each other than fighting, if you take away their mission orders. And that's pretty human too. Contrary to what a lot of pop culture shows, right-wing political leaders and edgy pseudo-philosophy will tell you, humans kind of dumped all their stat points into cooperation. That's how we've gotten this far as a species. At times we needed aggression to scare off predators or hunt our food, but we care for our sick and elderly and nurture our young for decades. We tell stories, sing around fires, and find joy in making things with our hands. We gift each other pretty or interesting things, and find so much joy in music that we have the built-in urge to dance. Our primal instincts are not bathed in blood, and our souls are made to connect. So, yeah. Thank you for your patience with this one. It's a goliath of a game. I forgot how ridiculously dense with character and story it is. Everywhere you look, there's amazing world building and things to stumble into. I really recommend playing it if you haven't already, even though I kind of spoiled everything. It's, it, it's still an amazing experience and there's so much I haven't talked about. I ended up cutting like a quarter of this script, but make sure you tune in next time so I can tell you all about uh, Drakengard 1 and 3 and the idea of spirit, how this ties the entire series together. Uh, thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye! <laughs>